So as usual, the meeting is being recorded. If you're uh, too shy to ask any questions, please put something in the chat and we'll respond to you. As always, you can email us anytime for any purpose at ccc at wakefield.gov.uk. So on the agenda today, we have Steve Turnbull giving us the regular COVID update, Sarah Ackers update on vaccines, Laura Jackson will be telling us a bit more about VR health matters, and we've got Ben Oldham, um, just an update on the winter wellness campaign and what's been happening. So without further ado, over to you, Steve, please. Thanks, Tracy. Okay, so uh, I've got a few slides to go through. Uh, I suppose before we get into the slides, which uh, the general picture uh, that we, we're seeing at the minute is that uh, COVID is, is not uh, creating a huge amount of uh, trouble uh, as it's done in the past. In fact, we were just reflecting that it's now three years pretty much since it all really started in the UK with lots of the virus circulating, but not being able to test or identify it. And certainly before we understood it very well before we could have vaccines and good treatment. So we're in a very different place now. So, uh, but it's, it's still around. So if we go on to the, the slides, Tracy, so uh, you'll remember that these are uh, around testing rates and positivity uh, and what happens when you get more COVID circulated is you get more people testing uh, and more people testing positive as a proportion. Uh, and what you can see here is it, it's, it's bouncing around a bit. The, uh, the one on the right, which is the numbers of people testing, is, is as you would imagine, it's gone, it's gone down quite quite a lot. So if we move on to the, the next slide, uh, and you can see here, they, uh, this is going back to uh, December. You can see that we did have uh, a spike in uh, de December, uh, and and then another spike in, in kind of January we had uh, it kind of picked up quite a bit then around the same time that we were experiencing other pressures like flu uh, which came and came very early and very high uh, but has subsequently disappeared uh, but also things like strep A uh, as well and again these most things have now started to go the right direction so strep A is still around but uh, it has fallen a lot. Influenza uh, has really fallen very well, and we're not expecting that to resurge uh, the rest of this season. So it's it's improved quite a bit, but you can see here that we're still getting COVID rates. We're still getting numbers of people in, uh, with with COVID. So it's not disappeared. It's still there in the background, uh, and that's right up to present day. Uh, we, we're going to lose this uh, information here. This is the ONS infection survey, and that's just been uh, announced last week that this will now be stood down nationally. So this is, uh, which is a, which is a bit of a shame from our point of view, because it enables us to spot little waves and possible trends. Uh, and you can see here Yorkshire and Humber at the bottom line, which means it's one of the lowest areas. We're about probably two percent. But this is going back uh, a couple of weeks now, so uh, it could change. We won't be able to, to know in any great detail whether that's changing in, in the background. But you can see some other areas are having similar levels, but some like the northeast, which is not a million miles away, having a bit of a spike uh, as well. So it's very variable uh, and, the, and probably uh, it's not very easy for us to use this information to decide what's happening locally. So knowing how many people that you know, uh, who are testing positive and hearing the number of people that you know uh, is kind of the best, probably possibly the best measure we've got at the minute, uh, as well as hospital beds being used for COVID patients. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then the same information, but this is by age groups. And again, you can see it, it's, uh, it's variable. Uh, School age, uh, you see those spikes when people go back to school, you'll see a, a, an upsurge, then it decreases again. Uh, and then that normally moves through the age groups. Uh, and the one obviously that we're always most concerned about uh, is the over 70s, because that's when uh, the, uh, you're more likely to have a, a poorly uh, episode and have a, a worse outcome from a COVID infection if you are more elderly, uh, which is why the, the vaccine is, is always pushed for uh, the elderly first. Uh, and you can see that, that picture there uh, has been increased uh, in the over 70s, um, but not, not certainly not at the levels we've experienced in the past. Uh, next slide, please, Tracy. That really doesn't tell us a lot. Uh, what that tells us is you can see the dark colours in the 80 plus age band. 
but that's because this is tested in hospital. So uh, you're going to get you know, people who go into hospital and get tested for COVID. You're going to you know, generally people who go into hospital uh, uh, more when they're more elderly, and therefore you, you'll see that. So that doesn't really tell us uh, anything meaningful about what's going on with COVID in the community. So we can move past that. Uh, and this is the probably the one of the best, apart from you know, knowing who you know and, and how many people that you know that are, are personally uh, having COVID symptoms, this is the, 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 the real best way we've got of tracking it currently. And you can see that wave after wave uh, picture. Uh, so... January 2021, that was the Omicron wave. Uh, we're still dealing with Omicron and all of its sub-variants. Nothing new has really come up to change that, apart from uh, various uh, subtypes of Omicron. But you'll see we get wave after wave, and we now uh, had the latest one was in January. Uh, and whilst that's, we come down from that little wave, uh, it's still there, and it's still... Uh, Last time I checked with the hospital last week, they had something in the region between 45 and 50 inpatients uh, with who were COVID positive. Compare that to flu, there was possibly one person in hospital with flu. So COVID doesn't seem to be going away in the same way that flu does, where flu is very seasonal. You get a big season uh, that can last uh, several weeks and then it disappears uh, and you wait for next year. COVID seems to be running throughout the year. We've had some dips in the summer, but not. But we've had some surges in the summer as well. So it's not behaving seasonally as we would have, we would have liked. Uh, so it's going to there, be there in the background, probably from from now on. Uh, so you'll have heard the term endemic. That basically means a, a disease that's out in the the community. It's just there in the background. What we're possibly dealing with here is something called a hyperendemic, and that just means it's endemic, but at a higher level. Uh, and having 40 to 50 people in hospital, uh, some of which will have been infected in hospital, because it's quite a difficult uh, uh, setting to control COVID. Uh, but having that number of people in hospital is is going to create it, mean it going to be harder for uh, NHS services to uh, catch up with the, the backlog. It's going to make it uh, have worse outcomes for people who get COVID whilst they're in hospital. Uh, nobody does better for having COVID. Mm -hmm. You can only do worse. Uh, uh, and so it's there in the background, just just being a drag on NHS services, but also a drag on individuals and, and society as well. Should not be on really. the database. So, uh, so, mm -hmm. so that's that's where we are. Uh, you sure? At the minute. Okay. okay. Uh, next slide, please, Tracy. Uh, right. uh, and of course. Uh, the number of deaths that we have uh, as from COVID, you can see the big waves cause a huge, uh, and this is the, the full uh, uh, journey of, of uh, where I feel throughout the COVID uh, pandemic. And you can see the huge spikes. What we've got now is a background rate. And, but it sadly does mean that whilst it's not in the news, uh, we're not having any restrictions, uh, we're not having any you know, mass testing anymore. It's still there in the background and it still sadly does mean that a small number of people every week uh, die uh, with a COVID infection and COVID being implicated in, in their death. And, and so that and that's not a, that's not a place we would have wanted to end up, but that's where we, we are uh, uh, nationally uh, and probably internationally. Uh, so it, it's just there in the background, sadly. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, that's it. Uh, Ooh, so, our <laughs> <was> surprise. <a> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Should have known that was the last slide, really. But happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, Denise uh, Pallet, I'm sorry, you seem to be on the loudspeaker, and I don't know why, because you're on mute on my screen. So, just to let you know that. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Steve, please, about the data or anything else? Uh, I don't think so. Just quickly have a look in the chat. Nothing in the chat. So thank you very much for that, Steve. And um, we've now got Sarah Ackers who's going to talk to us about the winter vaccinations. Sarah. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So you may be aware of some of this already because it's been covered in the press over the last week or so. Um, but last week, 
um, on Monday, the Joint Council for Vaccination and Immunisation asked us to um, deliver a very specific campaign in the spring. So I'm going to talk about that and then a little bit about what happens to people who aren't involved in the spring campaign and, and the future for them and their vaccinations. So spring vaccinations or the spring vaccination campaign that is going to start very shortly is going to be very similar to the one that ran this time last year. And it's really targeted at people whose immune function is less strong, either because of their age or because of some, an underlying condition that's giving them immunosuppression. So it's a much smaller group of people than the people who qualify for the booster in the autumn period. Um, you'll see some familiar names in that list of vaccines. So the vaccines this time are gonna be one new one, Sanofi, and then Moderna and Pfizer. Although the Moderna and Pfizer that we will be offering this season has been tweaked again. So it's actually been reformulated to be a bit more effective against a couple of the variants of Omicron that Steve was talking about, BA4 and BA5. And we're also offering a vaccine, Novavax, which um, has previously been offered to people who can't have one of the other vaccines because of an issue with their um, with an allergy to something in the vaccine. So it's not necessarily the COVID bit of the vaccine, it's something else in the vaccine that they're allergic to. Um, so just talking a little bit about that new vaccine, Sanofi. Um, it's actually Sanofi GSK. It's called something like Vid Prevtin Beta. So I'm just going to stick with Sanofi for the whole season. Um, what is interesting about Sanofi, it's performed really well in trials like the other ones. So it's on a par with the other ones. Um, we, we've been told it's particularly effective for people who are over 75. So we're going to be using it in care homes and the elderly. However, it is also suitable for use in some of those people who have allergy. So if someone's over 65 with allergy, they can be evaluated to see if they're able to have this Sanofi. And unlike Nuvaxavid, which was only offered in one place in West Yorkshire, it's likely that Sanofi will be available from several places locally. So, so I think that's quite useful for us to have this in our armory or in the fridge with the other vaccines. So in relation to how we're gonna deliver the program for the spring, we're just talking about care homes and then people over 75, including those who are housebound and then the immunosuppressed. So care homes will be visited by GPs along with the housebound, they'll do the care homes first. We're actually being asked to do or to start care homes over Easter, but most people will be um, able, who are eligible, will be able to book a vaccination after the 17th of April, which is when the main campaign starts. Um, so if you're 75, 75 plus or you're immunosuppressed and you want to have a vaccination after the 17th of April, you've got three choices. You can book online using the national booking system. Just go onto the NHS website and they're likely to um, open the booking slots either just before or more likely just after that Easter weekend. Um, and then you'll be offered an appointment after the 17th. Or you can await and get a text or an email or a letter from the national booking system. So that'll come from the national NHS system. Or you can also await an invitation from your GP. And again, it's likely to be a text, an email or a letter to invite you to book something that they're arranging locally. Um, what we normally see, we're learning from new campaigns all the time, but what we often see now is that the first six weeks are really busy. So they tend to be appointments only with just maybe one or two opportunities for walk-ins. But after probably the first six weeks, we are likely to start to advertise some walk-in capacity. Um, if you wait until end of May, early June time, what you might find is there's actually a bit less choice of where you can go or, or of appointments because it tends to get quieter for us. So, and we also need to let people know that we're actually going to pause completely at the end of June. There will be no opportunity for people to come forward and get their, um, their spring booster. So we're really encouraging you to, if you know somebody who needs the vaccination, don't let them, you know, put it to the, put it to the back of their mind. They need to get um, they need to get themselves booked in. Um, I always like to just point out what's special about children because they don't necessarily always ha have the same opportunity to go to every single clinic. They're not all assured to, to work with children. Um, 
there are a very, very small number of children who will be eligible this spring and almost all of them will have the vaccination offered to them directly by their GP. So they're a real priority for their GP. Um, I've been asked a few times recently about what happens now that Queen Elizabeth Vaccination Centre has closed. So a few people will be aware that was running near the, near the hospital. And we've also lost a very, very busy and popular site um, that was running at Pontefract Squash Club. What we've done for the spring is um, we've asked some of the other existing services to do a few more vaccinations. And we do expect that this means that Boots in the middle of Wakefield is going to get really busy. Uh, we've also managed to get a few new community pharmacies to come on board. And we are talking to the Squash Club about one of our existing uh, Wakefield based um, pharmacies, sometimes using some of their space to make sure that we, we've, we've got enough capacity. But there's no real concerns about that. You might just find that if you go to book online and you were expecting to see Queen Elizabeth Vaccination Centre, it won't be there anymore. But there will be a vaccination somewhere for you. OK, um, could I have the next slide, please? OK, so that that was talking about the vaccinations that are available to those people who don't hang on to their immunity very well due to age or immunosuppression. I think a lot of people are aware that basically since we started vaccinating and it's more than two years ago now, um, there's been a chance for everybody to access a vaccine if they are over the age of five um, up to this point. However, as we are moving now into more of a living with COVID approach for vaccinations along with daily life, um, what's happening with that is that's that's actually being um, closed, although there's at least three months notice of this now. So people do have a chance um, if they haven't yet had their first or second doses, that primary vaccination that's been running for over two years now, that they have still got a chance to, to accept that. So. If you have not yet had, or you know someone who's not yet had their first and second dose, they have up to the 30th of June to come forward to get those. Now, you need to leave a certain number of weeks between doses. So they really need to think about coming forward during April if they want to get fully vaccinated before the summer. We're then going to pause in the summer. And at that point, these new living with COVID arrangements will start. And what we're doing is we're moving into a twice yearly campaign pattern. So from autumn, if somebody hasn't had their first and second dose, they'll only be able to get it if they would otherwise be eligible for a booster. And that means that they have to be over 50 or in one of the at-risk categories. Other people won't be able to come forward for their first or second dose. So if you do know anybody, the clock is ticking. They do need to think about it. We'd also suggest that if somebody is over 50, even though they could get their first and second doses in the autumn, they can come and get those now, and then in the autumn they can have a booster. So there's no reason for people to hold off at this point. But as I say, that the, the, the clock is ticking. JCVI have said there's no need for us to continue to offer this forever. So um, if you know anyone who's been hesitant, then it's time to have a chat and say, look, you know, you, the, the opportunity is going to be withdrawn. Um, and the way that you book if you want your first or second dose, I would suggest the best way at the moment is to use the national booking system. And you can do that anytime because it's open now. Um, and you just literally go to the NHS's main website and it's towards the bottom of the page. There's a link for you to follow. OK, I think that's everything that we that I uh, wanted to share today. Um, I'll take any questions. That's fabulous. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Sarah? I'll just have a quick look in the chat. Nothing in the chat. You said it so explicitly that there's no questions at all. Everybody totally understood that. Well, Thank I'm, you. Yeah, I've done a few slides in the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly have. When yeah. Steve was saying before, before we let you all in from the waiting room, Steve was saying we've been at this three years now, COVID, three years. So when you think of all the messages that we've sent out to you as COVID champions, all the information that we've sent to you as COVID champions, and all the stuff you've shared, you have worked super hard for us over this last three years. Um, it just kind of brings it to life. It's been a long time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we've now got Laura, who is going to talk to us briefly about our adult health population survey. Oh, Steve's clapping his hands there. <laughs> I think he's giving you a round of applause, Sarah. Thank you. 
<laughs> Over to you, Laura. Thanks, Tracy. Hi, everyone. Um, today, I'd just like to talk about the um, Adult Population Health Survey that uh, went live at the end of February. And these, the survey is actually open until the 9th of April. Um, so I'll just share a bit about the survey. Um, it's open to all Wakefield residents uh, over the age of 18. Um, so when you go to fill out the survey, it will ask for your Wakefield postcode. Um, so the aim of the study is we'd like to learn more about the health and well-being of our residents. So we can tailor services um, to meet everyone's needs in the district. Um, as you know, we've got an increasingly diverse population in Wakefield, so it's essential that we engage with all our communities and neighbourhoods um, to ensure that the survey is representative of all our residents. Um, you might also be aware that we have worse out health outcomes for people living in poorer areas than those living in more affluent areas. So um, we're hoping to close that gap and improve everyone's health. Um, so again, that shows the importance of as many people uh, filling out the survey as possible. Uh, next slide, please, Tracy. Um, so how can you help us? We'd be really grateful if you could share any information about the survey, um, encourage people to fill it out, or if possible, assist people to fill it out, um, as we understand that there are some barriers in terms of the survey just being accessible online. Um, I've put the link to the survey at the bottom and there's also some more information on Wakefield Council website. Um, there's a helpline um, for anyone who needs any translation uh, into any other languages um, apart from English. And then if you see any of our social media posts that are going out on Facebook or Twitter, if you could reshare them, we'd be really, really grateful. Just a, a quick message from me today, so thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Laura. Does anybody have any questions from Laura? I don't believe I've sent information out about this via an email um, already to you, but I thought it would be really useful for Laura to just explain what, she, what they're doing and why, um, just as a bit of a reminder of how important it is really, particularly for those residents, like Laura said, who might live in the most deprived areas whose health outcomes are not as good which is really unacceptable in this day and age. Laura, we've also put it into our Recovery College newsletter for the last two weeks, um, different format each week to try and grab people's attention as if it was something new as well. So hopefully we should get a few more people from that that, that fill it out as well. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Lindsay's newsletter goes far and wide and it's one of the only rare ones really that I sit and read all the way through because it's really a super newsletter. And I'm sure if any of you want to have a copy of the newsletter, if you just drop me an email, I'm sure we can sort that out, can't we, Lindsay? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and equally, if there's anything anybody ever needs to promote or push, if you just send it along either to Tracy to forward on or directly to the Wakefield Recovery College inbox we can get it in. We've got a deadline of Tuesday evening to get it in for that Friday's edition. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I can't see any questions for you in the chat, Laura, but if we do get any emails or anything after, I'll forward them yeah. on to you. Oh, no, to thank me. you so much. Thank you. Oh, and that concludes my um, presentation so far, so I'll stop sharing. And we've got Ben Oldham next, please. Oh, cheers, Tracy. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've just got um, uh, get my screen shared. Just a quick uh, update for the uh, healthy housing pathway that was set up uh, last year. To the goal of it was basically to try and encourage or make it easier for professionals to flag up to us, uh, to the council. That is, people who are experiencing difficulty with fuel poverty, uh, poor housing conditions, and cold and uh, you know, damp and, and what have you at home. Um, okay, right, that's come up, and it? it's I haven't yeah. got my red board. So, so um, just real quick, so just to remind everyone, it was set up uh, last uh, July, a joint venture between public health and strategic housing, um, and provides insulation, boiler uh, assistance, financial support. 
um, support to resolve issues with housing conditions in private rented, uh, and then a few other bits, uh, bits and pieces around, uh, yeah, health and housing conditions. We got it rolled out to 129 agencies, uh, 340 staff seen in person or, or like this over Zoom, um, various networking events attended, um, and yeah, there's various places that we've, we've sort of pushed it and rolled it out. Um, in terms of the stats, so since uh, August, we've had 416 referrals. Uh, most of them are coming from the self the self referred, uh, but we're having a lot of feedback that that's that's on advice from professionals we're involved with. So, where GPs haven't fancied making a direct referral, they're often saying, "Oh, here's the website," and giving it to them. Um, so you can see we're getting roughly about just under a quarter from the keep the priority uh, of referrals are coming from the priority um, services we've identified, which is the NHS, children's services, carers, and, and what have you. Um, and what's the, what that's kind of translated to for the benefit of uh, residents of Wakefield, uh, 40 boilers and insulation measures installed over this winter. Uh, 25 direct grants from the Money Smart team to clear off energy debt uh, and like top up uh, credit meters and, and stuff like that. Uh, 17 enforcement notices for private rented housing conditions. Um, that a lot of that's been around like black mold and damp and you know where there's children or people with health condition present. Um, so we've got in there and got that got that changed. Um, connected for warmth is another insulation thing. Uh, oil filled radiators we've lent out. That's all, that only started a couple of weeks ago. It took us an age to be able to procure them um, in typical council fashion. But um, they're here now. And so if, if anyone does become aware of anyone who's heating uh, packs in, we do have them available uh, to tide them over until a resolution can be can be found. Uh, uh, I've got yeah, that's that was the uh, referral curve. Obviously, as you'd expect for this sort of thing, the referrals went up massively as we approached winter and the colder weather. Um, I've not updated it for February, but it seems to be coming down in in the similar uh, similar fashion that it went up. So, which is good. Uh, the vast majority of them were for uh, insulation and uh, boiler upgrade assistance. Uh, then money smart, and then a lot we just had to send to WDH because obviously as a, as a council we're not allowed to make uh, any sort of structural changes to WDH stock. So that's that was quite a big one. Uh, and then enforcement there on 25. Uh, these are for just not really that relevant, but just to look at, we've collected all this sort of data as to what to try and feed into what areas are kind of applying, are having the most difficult with fuel poverty and what have you. Um, but I'll get this sent round so you can look at these. And this is, I'm just kind of conscious of time with this one. Um, there's the EPC ratings um, as well. Diff 10 years. So the vast majority of applicants were owner occupiers, private renters. WDH and then other um, registered social landlords. Of the applications that we got in, um, mo the biggest vulnerability, the uh, priority vulnerability was for those with children and then those with a health condition, uh, 60 plus, uh, those just whose only issue was those at 60 plus were obviously much smaller and then non-priority was 49. Uh, yeah, the project's been refunded until uh, 2026. Um, it's had really good feedback. It's yeah, I know, I know I've never heard of such a, a long, uh, game, long period. So, so yeah, must have done something right. Um, unfortunately, there is we have got a problem at the moment with we've uh, made a we've got a problem where basically we're not going to be able to do installations for the next three months. Um, it's just to do with procurement and, and contracts expiring and stuff. But we are operating on a waiting list. <clears throat> and we have got a, um alternatives to people who just need assistance with insulation, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, and as, as mentioned, I've got those oil-filled radiators ready to go for people whose who's heating packs in um, this year. So if, if anybody... Um, 
uh, comes across anyone who's just literally the only qualifying criteria for this one is council tax bans A to D who've got under 200 mil of loft insulation can just get it for free. There's no other conditions, no other, um, as far as we know so far, it's recent. We've got a sort of agreed to become like a, a referral partner for him. But as, as far as we can tell, it's literally just anyone in council tax bans A to D. So there's no financial criteria. There's no, um, yeah, any of the usual stuff that we get. So uh, again, if anyone comes across anyone in council tax bans A to D, it was lacking on insulation, just uh, fire them through. Uh, this is just the, the application uh, information. As I say, I'll send this round, so it's going to it too much here. And I think that should be it. Yeah, so yeah, a, po a positive um, winter that we've had. Plenty of measures got into people's homes and, uh, yeah, refunded for a good old while. So, yeah, jobs are good in. That's excellent, Ben. The amount of work you've done in such a small space of time and to get that work um, funded for such a long time as well is credit to you. Well done. Oh, thank you. Going to do it without uh, everyone referring in. So excellent work. Does anybody have any questions for Ben? I can't see anything in the chat. Um, and Ben's going to send the slides around, so I will be able to share those with you. Um, well, I think Manira will be sending them out tomorrow, so I'll make sure that you get those. Sorry, slides. Tracy. Yeah. Ben, do you mind if we add those slides or add some information from those slides into our bill busting stuff that we do at the college? I know uh, you sent me yeah. things before, but yeah, yeah, okay, cracking, thank you. Yeah, no problem, I'll get them over to you. Fantastic, great bit of networking there. And Lindsay, you sound so poorly, bless you, I hope you're feeling better soon. Oh, so you just know before... what? It's all come out in like 24 hours, it's rubbish. Oh. <laughs> I blame our friend's three-year-old, she was full of it the other weekend, so... Oh, Eric. <laughs> Stay at home and keep warm, then look after yourself. Um, just before we finish, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we spoke briefly at the last meeting about access to GPs and how some people found access to GPs difficult. And we have uh, made contact with Dr. Colin Spears and some of his, um, his people, and they have offered to do a GP special for us, like we did once before, where we asked people to come and talk to us about any issues that they might be having so that they can respond and, and have some dialogue with you. I haven't been sent any dates yet, but as soon as I do, I will be sending them out and, and asking for you all to please, um, if you've got any questions, comments, or if you've heard any of your neighbours, friends, network, colleagues, please do let us know and we'll try to answer all those questions for you. So thank you very much to all of the speakers today who has given us lots of really valuable information. Thank you to all the champions for coming along to attending these meetings, uh, for doing what you do and sharing information wider. I hope you have a lovely rest of the, the day, rest of the evening, um, and I shall see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye. See you later, guys. Have a good day.